Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean Adams, and I am the chair of the Department of History, and it's my honor to welcome you to our event this evening. I'm going to just spend a few minutes bragging about the History Department, um, and then I will pass things over um, to my colleague and friend from history, uh, Bonnie Efros, who will offer a more formal introduction of the candidate. As I said, um, as somebody who actually has worked very closely with the center in the past, it's a, it's a great honor to, um, to welcome you here, and, and we're really proud um, to co-sponsor this uh, great speaker series um, on death, which is something that I guess all historians uh, know about um, so far. Um, we haven't had anyone escape it yet, so uh, we'll give you an update um, when it does finally happen. It'll be a very historic moment. Um, but on a lighter note, I guess, uh, what I'd like to do is, is talk about how excited we are in the Department of History um, about uh, a kind of rejuvenation uh, of the program and some of the, the great faculty that we've added in the past few years. And what's particularly exciting about it is that we've had new faculty come in uh, at various levels of their career and uh, excel uh, immediately. Um, so, for example, in, in African history, we added through the preeminence initiative at the University of Florida, um, Dr. Nancy Hunt, um, and uh, her book, uh, Nervous State, won the 2016 uh, Martin Klein Prize for African History. Uh, so she, right off the bat, came in uh, and really added to our department's research profile. Um, we also, uh, in the past few years, have added uh, Dr. Ibram Kendi, uh, who is a joint hire with African American Studies. And as many of you, I'm sure, already know, uh, Ibram's book, Stamped from the Beginning, won the National Book Prize this year. So we are all very excited about that and excited to be in such close proximity to uh, a celebrity uh, like Ibram, um, who is off every weekend giving talks at places. Um, but we've also added Lauren Perlman, uh, another joint hire with African American Studies, uh, whose book is going to be coming out very shortly on uh, Washington and the Civil Rights Movement, and so you should all keep an eye out for that. Uh, Lauren is an emerging young scholar uh, in the field of urban history and uh, the history of civil rights, and we're excited to add her to our faculty. And then finally, I have to put just a placeholder in because the History Department is currently looking to add to our top ten program in Latin American history, uh, with a new uh, junior professor. Uh, we are currently doing a search for an assistant professor. We've had the candidates in. Uh, they're all fantastic, and so uh, whoever we choose, uh, there'll be a real addition to what's already, uh, as I said, a top ten program. So what I found interesting when I was thinking about what to brag about uh, for the History Department today is that we have uh, four levels, uh, four distinct levels of additions to the faculty and what it means, hopefully, is that the future is really bright for our department. Um, and I know uh, from experience in the past that that future is going to continue to be working with the Center for Humanities in the public sphere because uh, it is a fantastic organization uh, and one, as I said, that the History Department is, is pleased to partner with. So with that said, uh, my bragging is done. And now I'm going to hand things over to Bonnie Efros. Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out uh, to tonight's lecture by Professor Isabel Morera. Um, our series, as many of you already know, um, is on death, confronting the great divide. And um, we um, are so excited that um, we'll, be, um, we'll have three more events, uh, one tonight and then also one in March and one in April that will help complete the series. So each year, the Humanities Center brings a, a speaker series to campus to discuss the historical, cultural, and ethical perspectives of the humanities uh, to bear on an issue that relates to our everyday lives. And this year, our speaker series, as you know, is on death, a theme that's occupied human beings since time immemorial. And our series, as many of you know, last semester started with contemporary issues including landscape of cemeteries and crematoria, portable memorialization of death through things like tattoos and car stickers and video games, and also the devastation of attacks on migrant and poor communities uh, in Mexico. 
This evening, however, we're going to be turning to more uh, distant temporally exa temporal examples um, of reactions to and rituals for death, in this case focused on the late antique Mediterranean. Tonight's lecture by Professor Morera, Morera excuse me, will allow us to visualize how 5th century elites thought about death in the afterlife and claim the relevance of such discussions in the context of Christianity. For these elites, as, a bit, as has been noted recently by Peter Brown, it was important to discern indeed what, if any, place there was for wealth in the afterlife and how wealth might be used to ease passage into the more desirable regions of the next world. Before I introduce our speaker more formally, I do have to take care of a bit of business, and I hope that you'll um, um, be able to join us for the talks I mentioned in March, uh, which will be at the Harn Museum, and in April here again in Smathers Library. Uh, one talk will focus on uh, relic, relics and reliquaries in late medieval Europe, and the second will talk about uh, Islam in uh, North Africa. By means of historical, comparative, and intersectional perspectives on death, we hope that these distinguished lectures um, will give us insights into the mechanisms that humans have developed over millennia to rationalize, mythologize, theorize, cope with, and overcome its associated, associated losses. For more information about our series, we have um, uh, information on the table over there. Um, and you can also sign up for our weekly uh, e-newsletter called the Humanities Agenda. Uh, and after this talk, there will be time for questions and answers. So I'd like to thank the many people and organizations that have made tonight's event possible. We thank in particular Sophia Akerd, who's the Associate Director of the Humanity Center, who makes all things run and work as they should. Tim Blanton and Maddie Collins, who are our graduate coordinators, who um, probably greeted you at the door as you came in, um, as well as uh, shared services for processing much of the financial uh, paperwork that makes events like these possible. Our series, of course, is made possible by the Rothman Endowment at the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere uh, in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences with co-sponsorship from the college as well as the Office of Research, the School of Art and Art History's Harn Eminent Scholar Lecture Series, the Smathers Libraries, where we are today, the Department of History, the Center for Latin American Studies, the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the Department of Religion, the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, the Alachua County Library District, the Digital Worlds Institute, and the Honors Program. As you can see, we bring together uh, many constituencies. So after many months of planning, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Professor Isabel Morera. Professor Morera earned her doctorate at St. Andrews University and shortly thereafter spent two years in Mainz, Germany at the, uh, the Institute for Europäische Geschichte. Since 1992, she's taught at the University of Utah, where she specializes in late antique and early medieval history, and she served as chair there of her department from 2011 to 2016. She published her first book, Dreams, Visions, and Spiritual Authority in Merovingian Gaul, with Cornell University Press in 2000, this work examined how authority was constructed at the margins of established institutions of power and how an ideology of open access to the spiritual realm was maintained in the face of more repressive forces. In 2010, she published Heaven's Purge, Purgatory and Late Antiquity with Oxford University Press. And this was a work that was very important in pushing the dating of purgatorial ideas in Christianity from the 12th century, where it was held that purgatory began by scholars such as Jacques Le Goff, um, and pushed them more than a half a millennium earlier to the period of late antiquity. Professor Morera also edited with Margaret Toscano a collection of 15 articles entitled Hell and Its Afterlife, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives that spans from Hell's classical roots in the modern era um, classical roots, excuse me, to the modern era of graphic novels and journalism uh, in an era of terrorism. She's currently the co-editor of the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of the Merovingian World publication. We hope it will occur in 2018. Um, and this is a work that brings together um, more than 45 historians, art historians and archaeologists to explore the breadth of new research on the Merovingian period. Thus, without further ado, I hope that you will join me in welcoming Professor Isabel Morera, who will speak this evening on preparing for death, reflections on possession and loss in late antiquity. <laughs> 
first I want to say thank you very much, um, first of all to all for being here, um, but of course also to uh, Bonnie and her staff at the Center for the Humanities and the Public Sphere. I'm really delighted to have this opportunity uh, to talk to you today. Um, as, you, as Bonnie said, my, my most recent work has been on, um, on purgatory, and although I'm not going to much mention it tonight, um, by the end of the hour, you might actually feel that you've visited there. <laughs> okay, so, um, so I'm very honored to have been asked to participate in this wonderful series on death. Looking at the other presentations being offered, it seems that my is the one that is going furthest into the past, into the most remote period. The time frame that I'm looking at is, is a, a period of late antiquity, sometimes it sort of merges into the early Middle Ages, basically 400 to 800, but especially today for the 5th century, which was a tumultuous century as the late Roman Empire gave way in the West uh, to individual Christian kingdoms. It was an era of political rupture and social and religious anxiety, but also an era of cultural transitions and affirmations. The culture of Christianity was changing and with it, the culture of death. And some of that had to do with the way Christians of this era thought about the connection of possessions and death. I don't think it's controversial to say that we often associate possessions and death today. When thinking about death, we may make a will. We think about what we're leaving behind for our friends and family, and we think about how we want to, our bodies to be disposed of. It was no different in late antiquity. People made wills too, and they're really fascinating documents. Um, people also thought about how they wanted their lives to be remembered, and how they wanted their bodies to be disposed of. But there was another element that was important to them that I don't, do not think looms as large today, and that is the connection of possessions with salvation. And that was for a reason. If we are to believe the sources that have come down to us, late antique Christians were dinned by the voices of the clergy, the words of the liturgy, the saints' lives that formed popular pious reading, and the terrifying visions of the afterlife that were circulated and preached. And all these voices had a message. What you do with your possessions will affect your fate in the afterlife. Possessions and salvation go together whether as an opportunity to improve your fate or as a means to drag you down into hell. And because this was so, the gain of possessions, but even more so their loss, could be seen as having an impact not only on the comfort of one's earthly life, but also on one's salvation after death. It is this intersection of life, death, possessions and salvation that I want to explore today. So why look at death and possessions together? Well, the first and most obvious reason is because a lot of what we know about the early medieval world uh, derives from the examination of objects of possessions. Um, and this is uh, because the, the period that I'm interested in, from 400 to 800, Christians who had the resources to do so placed objects, sometimes uh, many very sumptuous objects, in graves. It was a Christian practice, or at any rate, a sanctioned Christian uh, practice for Christians. And of course, you know, it, it, so many of the possessions that we have today are things that came out of graves. Second, the relationship of death with material concerns, especially with wealth, and this disposition of wealth, has been a very lively subject in scholarship in the last few years, especially with the publication of Peter Brown's research on poverty and wealth in late antiquity. He's actually written four books so far on, on poverty and wealth. And um, by and large, they, they, they focus on the institutional views of, uh, on this subject. Um, third, although there's been this wonderful work done on the problem of wealth and the ideal attitudes to wealth that Chris, the Christian church had to develop in consequence, there is still work to be done on the connections of possessions, especially personal possessions and pers the personal dimension of ownership, with Christian ideas about death and salvation. Peter Brown's uh, book, Ransom for the Soul, comes closest to examining this nexus of, wealth, uh, of um, wealth and salvation in the West, uh, 
But I want to take a different tack on this issue and look at some different voices to uncover some of the very human concerns that possessions posed for those that confronted death. So what were the Christians told to think about possessions as they prepared for death and the afterlife? Uh, to provide some context that will be important later, I want to start by sketching out two big ideas in Christian teaching. Um, these are ideas that, pe that Professor Peter Brown has brought uh, very forcefully to the fore of the discussion of wealth and poverty. The first was, to follow Christ, you must give up everything. In the book of Matthew, Jesus said, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. This was a radical call to poverty in a single dramatic act that transferred the wealth of this world into treasure in heaven. This was the model monasteries set before the eyes of their monks. Voluntary poverty was the ideal way to follow Christ. The second big idea was keep your possessions but give alms. The book of Tobit states, to all those who practice righteousness, give alms from your possessions so that you will be laying up a good treasure for yourself against the day of necessity. For almsgiving delivers from death and keeps you from going into the darkness. Indeed, almsgiving for all who practice it is an excellent offering in the presence of the Most High. This was the advice promoted by Augustine and other clerics who saw the pastoral benefit to the giver in giving alms as a part of a way, sent, a way of life centered on Christ. So not a dramatic big show of renunciation, but rather the low profile sustenance commensurate with humility and godliness. But of course, both these ideals of wealth transfer had their adherents and their heroes. Monastic communities tended to showcase that dramatic sell all your possessions position, and indeed it was a fixture of monastic rules. The monk and or nun had to renounce all wealth and enter the, the monastery as a pauper. At the same time, the call to give alms to the poor and other forms of charity was preached to the laity from the bishop's uh, cathedra, from his, his um, episcopal throne. As was perhaps to be expected, Anxieties and ideologies around wealth were far more developed in, sorry, about wealth were far more developed in the ancient world than ideas about poverty, the poor being, as Brown notes, more honored in the abstract than in the flesh. The parable of the difficulties of the camel going through the eye of the needle had more to do with the problem of the rich man than it did with the virtue of the poor man. And in the fourth and fifth centuries, a considerable tension existed in the public life and in theological rhetoric about what constituted the ideal disposal of wealth, how it should be disposed of, by whom, and to whose benefit. The answer to these questions played out at all levels of social interest, at the institutional level of civic life, the claims of the church to be the guardians of the poor, the pastoral concerns exhibited in the focus on the giver, and the poor themselves, who were often the abstracted subjects uh, of sermons specifically linked with the figure of Christ. As Brown notes, this rhetoric rarely focused on the poor as somehow deserving claimants to the resources controlled by the rich, and indeed it was actually a very limited category of poor who were supported, namely ascetics and the clerical poor. So, you know, give alms but give it to the church in another way. But the point I want to make uh, today is that the tension between the two biblical traditions um, is that they do not encompass all the ways people thought about giving. They, they are not true opposites. Those who push these models on Christians were offering advice on the disposal, sorry, the disposal of wealth and possessions, um, and they both claimed the poor as the beneficiary. But these two models of giving did not account fully for all the ways that Christians thought about their possessions. Today, I want to look at a 5th century aristocrat, Paulinus of Pella, who has left us a poem that, that gives us a rather challenging but intriguing view of a Christian thinking about death, possessions, and salvation. Paulinus of Pella is strangely neglected by historians. Sandwiched in time between two far more prominent figures of his class, Orzonius and Sidonius Apollinaris, 
Paulinus and his poem usually comes up when discussing the impact of barbarians on landowners in 5th century Gaul. But his autobiographical poem is a rare gem, speaking to God and the reader of the pleasure of possessions and the tragedy of loss. He wrote it in the 460s at the age of 83, yeah. after a life of many trials, as a poem of thanksgiving. As he prepares for death, which must not be too far off, he dwells in 616 lines on his history, anxieties, and hopes for salvation. And so I hope to introduce Paulinus to you today. So who was he? Paulinus was born in Pella in Macedonia in the late 370s. Apart from lands which were owned by his family there, he had no other connection with the Eastern Mediterranean. At the age of three months, he was taken along with the rest of his family to North Africa, and then, at three years, to Bordeaux in southwest France, where his grandfather, Orzonius, still resided. Paulinus remained in Gaul for the remainder of his life. According to his own account, he was 30 years old when the Rhine Limes were breached by the Vandals and the Alans in the winter of 406-407. In the years following, he had dealings with Visigoths and Alans, which, and he must have died in the 460s at a time when the Western Roman Empire still had emperors of Roman stock and before they were replaced by the barbarian um, variety. And I think I might just quickly take this opportunity to show a map. Okay, there we go. Oh, so, nice picture there, okay. So, um, the place that Bordeaux is here, um, and the other place that we're going to mention is Marseille down here. So, basically, we're just dealing with the area of southern Gaul. Okay. Paulinus prefaces his poem with the explanation that his work is a little meditation. He relates the events of his life in the order they occurred, so as to show that all his life has been guided by God. He acknowledges that in his early life he lacked nothing, but now, he writes, God has disciplined me with continual trouble. And while he must learn not to love present prosperity, he hopes that he should not be greatly upset by hardships in which his mercy always assists me. It is his life's experience that will enable Paulinus to develop an idea and understanding of God's wisdom. Indeed, Paulinus's poem may have been a form of devotional exercise suggested to him by a religious mentor. He decided to end his days in Marseille because, he tells us, many holy men who had been friends were living there. The monks of the Rhone Valley and of Marseille and the island of the monastery of Lerins were at the forefront of a new penitential asceticism, one that was more personal and individually ascetic than the great public tradition of penance had been in the preceding century. The poem's final words elucidate both Paulinus' faith and his doubt. In light of the fact that he has submitted himself to the laws pleasing to God, he had tried hard to obtain salvation, and he asks God to make it so that he will not fear death, and that whatever his final fate may be, the hope of con contemplating Christ will mitigate those fears, and that all his doubts will be dissipated by a certain faith. How should such sentiments be understood? If God had intervened throughout his life to shape it to his will, why did Paulinus have cause for doubt? Let us look at the evidence as Paulinus presents it to us. First, Paulinus lists those good things that he enjoyed in his early years and which he viewed as a sign of God's favor. One, he lives in a beautiful countryside blessed by the fertile river Garonne. Two, he has an illustrious father and grandfather. His grandfather was, in fact, Ozonius and um, had had a, a, a stellar career. Three, he has had the benefit of a good Roman education without some of its rigor. Four, even though he was gravely sick in his youth, his life improved as a result 
because his parents indulged him, and this deepened his already affectionate ties with his father. And then five, he inherited a grand house, servants, horses, and finery. And I thought at this point I would show you just exactly the kind of possessions Paulinus had around him and that, you know, he might be sorry to have lost. Okay. Oh, sorry, going the wrong way here. Okay. So, um, so Paulinus lives in a villa and, you know, I'm just going to show a couple of images of what a villa would look like. It's sort of um, out in the countryside, but probably not too far out, probably sort of fairly suburban to, to a... Uh, to a, a city uh, or town, um, in this case, uh, Bordeaux. As you can see, I mean, a villa would have been a very pleasant place to hang out. It has gardens. It's, you know, it's, it is an agricultural center, but it's, uh, it's uh, as I said, a uh, sort of pleasant place. And, um, and the interiors would have been very much decorated. Now, I'm, I was just pulling some images off, off the web here to show you um, that, you know, these were, would be um, very luxurious um, for somebody of, of Paulinus's rank, very luxurious, very colorful. Um, and, you know, again, th this is the kind of house that I think we could all bear to live in, right? Um, look how, you know, the painted walls, the mosaics on the floor. Um, and, and you got to do great things there. You know, you went, uh, you went hunting, uh, you had horses. Um, and he talks about, you know, how great it is that he's got horses and a chariot. Uh, you find love there. Uh, lots of food. I mean, it's the one thing that the Romans loved to portray was food. So you have lots of dining scenes. Um, this is their, their sort of throwing the, 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 the food bits on the floor here. Um, <laughs> that's really great. There's actually somewhere in there, there's a little, little mouse attempting to eat a walnut. Um, you know, you have wine. Uh, it's really important, of course. And, you know, and the villas, um, you know, even uh, small villas, um, aspired to this kind of style and had beautiful mosaics. And look how cramped the space is, but it has a beautiful mosaic on the floor. Uh, more food, more food. Ah, oh, that's cute. And it's just more food. Okay, and then what do you eat your food off? Well, Paulinus ate his off fantastic uh, dinnerware. Uh, so here is a, this is from the Milden Hall treasure. It's in the British Museum. This is a, a fourth century treasure trove. But these are, you know, dining, plates for dining, beautifully made, beautiful beautiful stuff. Um, also dress was very opulent in this period. Um, this is actually from the 6th century, so it's a bit later. This is the Empress Theodora and her ladies, and you can sort of see the beautiful um, uh, patterns on the clothing, and, but also look at the curtains um, that churches also had a lot of these kind of very colorful uh, curtains in them, and, and a villa would have had them to divide the space in the house. Um, here's an example of a, a tunic uh, from uh, late antiquity, um, and they, they would have had these sort of decorations on them. And again, th these, are, I mean, I, this, these uh, images um, are coming directly from a wonderful exhibit of late antique textiles um, that was held fairly recently, and, and they're just extraordinary. I mean, extraordinary that they've survived. Um, but they all sort of show a pleasure, a bonhomie, you know, um, good times. So we don't have any portraits of Paulina Sapella, unfortunately, or, any, or, or his wife or anything. So I'm going to claim this one as his, the image for his wife. I'm going to claim this one for the image of his mistress. And, um, and this is Stilico, very famous, but this kind of gives you some idea of sort of the clothing of the era. Um, this, uh, they would wear this very you know, lovely tunic with a, with a cloak and, the, and the, uh, the fibula that held the cloak together and, and uh, the woman also, that's Serena. Okay, so let's just leave it there for a second. Um, okay, so he inherits the grand house, these servants, his horses, and his finery. In time, he acquired another symbol of his high status, a wife of good family who was poor. The ultimate display of his wealth, then, was the luxury of giving wealth and consequence to one of his own class without anxiety of suffering loss in the process. Doesn't this sound like Jane Austen to you? Opportunity to give that consequence to a poor member of your class. These external things are viewed as a blessing. God's approval shone on him and his family 
To do him credit, Paulinus did his best to deserve this comfort, demonstrating at an early age some sterling qualities and principles that anticipated his Christian sensibilities in other areas. He tells us he did not rape women. He did not consort with other men's wives. He confined his sexual desires to household slaves, and he did not acknowledge any of his illegitimate offspring. That's a good thing, right? Because you're not going to alienate property. In other words, he was a son of whom his parents could be and were proud, and whose concern for the reputation of his family was keen and readily apparent. And perhaps, after all, his self-restraint in sexual matters did indeed set him apart from the hedonistic youths who were his peers and who was severely criticized at the time by the presbyter Salvian of Marseille. But in 406, two disasters uh, befell him. The barbarians overran Gaul, and Paulinus's indulgent and beloved father died. Suddenly, Paulinus was left as the master in charge of a bevy of women who, as it turned out, did not supply him with the unstinting servitude that a male of his position felt he had the right to demand. The losses now came, and they were major. His luxurious villa was looted by Goths. While in residence at an, uh, sorry, while in residence at an unnamed city, another group of Goths robbed him, looted his mother's house, and then burned it. The family moved on to Bazaar, where they found themselves under siege, and Paulinus, who held an official position under the short-reigned Emperor Attalus, narrowly escaped an assassination attempt. His friends, i.e. Romans, looted his properties in the east, and two of his sons failed in their endeavors to ameliorate the family's position, and their properties were also forfeited. Other sons are mentioned as living in luxury on the property that Paulinus had once owned. But finally, he decided to live in Marseille, where he had some property and slaves, but which he viewed as an exile from his Aquitanian homeland. Paulinus had been given some opportunities for self-actualization appropriate to a man of his rank. He was appointed as overseer of the private largesse by the emperor Attalus, but this turned out not to be the money-making uh, opportunity he had hoped. He was the unwitting savior of a city in which he and his family had taken refuge, but gained no glory from it. And finally, he became a kind of monk monke. Each of these occasions presented Paulinus with an opportunity to take control of his fate and provide the kind of leadership that was often rewarded with high office for a man of his status, especially one already inclined to the religious life and who had saved a city from destruction. Did he fail to recognize these opportunities? Or is it possible that knowing Paulinus better than we do, these opportunities were not extended to him by people around him? Invariably, Paulinus blamed places the blame for these failures at the door of others, especially his avaricious sons and the vulnerable women folk whose needs thwarted him. But then his mother died, followed by his mother-in-law and later his wife. His comment on his wife's death strikes one as particularly cold-hearted. This is a quote. She who, blinded by her fears, opposed my legitimate desires also caused me sorrow when she died because she was taken away from me at just that time when she might have been some use to me by bringing consolation to my advancing years. But his monastic vocation, his monastic vocation in particular points to a man of lukewarm understanding. At Easter 421, when he was uh, 45 years old, Paulinus returned to the communion of the church and decided to adopt the ascetic life. His midlife religious conversio was somewhat typical of his class, but unlike more famous converts to the ascetic life like Paulinus of Nola or Sulpicius Severus, Paulinus did not have the energy to impress others with his holiness, nor did he give up his possessions to the poor in order to become poor himself. He confessed his sins, those sins, he tells us, that required to be confessed, 
And he set himself to live according to the monastic rule or way of life. He did not do this with the exact atonement or penance required by his sins, he admits, but was rather, quote, animated by a firm intention to follow orthodox teachings after having learned to recognize the paths of false opinion that leads to heresy. That is to say, Paulina set his own rules for leading an ascetic life, which did not involve accepting ecclesiastical oversight, and he chose to be his own best judge of what constituted the right way to live. Rigorous self-deprivation was clearly not Paulinus' forte, and one can't help but remember his comments about his education, that it too had lacked rigor. Essentially, Paulinus' spirituality was of a passing grade variety. Furthermore, Paulinus' intention was not to join a monastery, you know, another monastery, but to live a, a secluded life in relative comfort on his estate. This was the kind of monasticism that was rejected by John Cassian and later the Benedictine rule. There were a few examples of this kind of life done well, but Paulinus' experiment cannot be counted among them. His wife, who was still alive at this juncture, would have been involved in this kind of manor house conversion. Wives of villa-bound male ascetics had the dubious honor of continuing their domestic tasks in a newly solitary environment, running the household so that meals appeared on time, providing other amenities of a pleasant life, while living separated from their husband's company most of the day and all of the night. Even as a quasi-monk, he had set his sons to the task of trying to regain his lost estates. His disappointment in them and his lack of empathy for their struggles is at this point hard to excuse. His harsh reflections on his family and his self-absorption point to an individual whose personality appears blighted. In short, a man who is mu as much crippled by his lack of self-awareness as he is by the things he has lost. When he finally came to reside in Marseille, in a modest house, although still with servants and an orchard and other things, he considered his losses. In addition to his wife, his sons also died. His comments on them, on all of them, are in the same breath as the expressions of his sorrow at his loss of property. One of his sons had become a priest, but died an untimely death that brought Paulinus, quote, bitter sorrow, while all such possessions of mine as he held were wholly torn from me by a single act of many robbers. Likewise, Paulinus continues his other son, died. After losing all my goods, he came to a like end. So these the property and death are all in the same sentence, the same phrase, right? But it is the loss itself that Paulinus offers to God and his poem of, and his poem of thanksgiving. His words, he says, are his recompense to God for his debt of thanks. His final lines are a prayer that whatever his fate in the, after death may be, that at the end confidence in his salvation will replace his doubts. Paulinus' words, his life, are his offering. And an offering is what was required um, at the Eucharistic celebration. And so his poem is called the Eucharisticos, which is thanksgiving, but it's also an offering. So it's a, a poem in which he offers himself. Paulinus' final reflections on his career as a Gallo-Roman aristocrat, confronting a god who he appears not to completely understand, tempts one to dismiss him as deserving of his final lonely years of exile, his fear of death, and his doubts about salvation. It is almost as if he offers up his losses as a thanksgiving in order to keep the tally in front of God's eyes, shaming God into the kind of re recompense expected by the martyrs. So you get a sense, right, that um, I, I'm a little judgmental about Paulinus. <laughs> okay, but it's our job to understand him, and, and uh, there are some ways in which the context of his times helps us to do this. First, his literary endeavor was not unusual in his time. Although the poem has often been mined for its information on barbarian presence in Gaul, the work is most readily understood as a kind of reflect reflective exercise that aristocrats viewed 
as dignifying their old age. There were models for it close at hand, such as the poem of the Spanish Pruden uh, poet Prudentius, who wrote that, quote, the end is close on me, and by now what God is adding to my days is, uh, is the border of old age. What profitable thing have I done in all this length of time? Prudentius proceeds to outline his youth under the rod, his corruption under the toga, his one-time affinity for lewdness, his governance of cities, and his rise to imperial service. Will such things, good or bad, be of any profit after my flesh is dead, when death shall have wiped out all that I was, he asks? The idea of literary retrospection as a preparation for death and thoughts about salvation uh, would have been familiar to Paulinus and his audience. Paulinus also had the renowned Augustine to model his work on. Augustine of Hippo's Confessions provided a model for Paulinus's work. Like Augustine, Paulinus dedicated his work to God as a work of thanksgiving. But unlike Pauline, uh, Augustine's Confessions, which attempted to document the interior life of a man nearing conversion, Paulinus's autobiographical account focused on external events and his personal reflections were largely prompted by them. As his experience was one of enormous loss of property and family, the things that he generally is thankful for are the lessons taught to him by loss. Thus, in his poem, Paulinus attempted to enumerate all the losses he had endured and to give thanks to God for them, identifying them as a sign of God's continued agency in his life. In short, he had to convince himself and perhaps others that his losses were not a sign that he had been abandoned by God. Whereas this debt to Augustine's confessions is clear, I would also suggest that Augustine's City of God provided a context for Paulinus's views. The City of God was, of course, the great story of loss writ large, the empire that must be lost in order that the empire of heaven be gained. Paulinus's coupling of his loss of his father and of the empire together in 406 suggests that Paulinus was not reticent to use a broad canvas for comparison. Surprisingly, Paulinus doesn't use Job as a reference point for his trials, even though in some ways it would fit. But perhaps he thought it would be understood. I don't know. Finally, the poem could be uh, viewed as a spiritual exercise that arose in the background of his association with the Marseille crowd of ascetics with whom Paulinus lived at the end of his life and who, in addition to God, may have been the audience for the work. Paulinus then provides us with a perspective on death, possessions, ownership, and loss that arises from common models, but which is in some ways quite tied to the particular stresses of the times, and that uh, is also idiosyncratic. This is something I'm going to return to. It's kind of hard to know, uh, in that he does not follow the best practices for the spiritual life that it could have been laid out for him. His poem alerts us to the role that possessions played in the final thoughts of a man who strove to find spiritual consolation at the same time as spiritual security. Even at this late date, close to death, Paulinus could not let his possessions go entirely, either as his good memories tied to the better times or as the scourge that their loss became. He still hoped that his loss and his story, both possessions of a kind, could be used to negotiate his last stand before God. Okay. Paulinus is sometimes characterized as an example of the waning voice of the Gallic aristocracy, with an almost quixotic adherence to its core Roman values. But seen another way, Paulinus was voicing an alternative Christian position on wealth and loss and death and salvation, one that may have been more common than the church sources would allow. Paulinus' attempt to reconcile his loss with his relationship to God makes him a voice for a different kind of discourse, a discourse based on real hardship as opposed to notional hardship. If Peter Brown is right about the beneficiaries of alms being the clerical and ascetic poor as opposed to just any poor person, there may even be a strain of anti-clericalism in Paulinus' preference for controlling his own possessions. But the Marseille crowd with its eye of the needle sermons, might have injected doubt into Paulinus' self-image as a good Christian who might be saved. And thus Paulinus offers his loss as an equivalent. <laughs>
So while Paulinus was worrying about his salvation in genteel hexameters, another kind of literature, visions of the afterlife, offered Christians an uncomplicated view of possessions and salvation. Um, by comparison to this gentle verse, visions of the afterlife were blunt instruments. Perhaps the most influential visionary text in circulation in the early 5th century and in Paulinus' lifetime was the vision of Paul. This was a work that took somewhat direct aim at those who, like Paulinus, claimed the public status of the ascetic life, but who did not fully renounce the world. The vision of Paul states that hell awaited those who seemed to renounce the world, putting on our garb, but the impediments of the world have made them wretched. And, moreover, not even on one day did their prayer ascend pure to the Lord God, but many impediments of the world detained them, and they were not able to do right in the sight of God. The fate of such people was to be clothed in rags of fiery pitch and sulfur, and have dragons coiled around their necks and shoulders and feet, and have angels close up their nostrils, which actually, given that you're in a sulfurous environment, doesn't sound like a bad idea. In another place in, in hell, those who trusted in their riches would end up in a river infested with worms that would devour them. This was to become a common way of discussing those in the religious life who were still embroiled in worldly possessions and concerns. Some visionary accounts, like Paulinus of Pella's poem, focused on an individual's life story that had to be recalled as death neared. Since visionaries returned to life to tell their tales, but often reportedly died shortly thereafter, such visions were a kind of preparation for death through anticipation. They represented a trial run of what the visionary or the vision's author thought could be expected after death, and money, property, and possessions loom large in these visions. Let's look at one visionary, Barontus. Barontus was a 7th century Frank, and like Paulinus of Pella, he was a man of rank and wealth. We have less autobiographical information on him than we do for Paulinus to provide context for his situation, but in the written account of his vision, the issue of the correct way of giving and its consequences for salvation are played out in dramatic fashion. Barontus had lived his life in the world, where he pursued his seemingly lucrative career and enjoyed the benefits of his social prominence, such as having had three wives over his lifetime, uh, presumably in succession, and uh, one son who was in the monastery of St. Peter of Lombre, uh, the monastery to which Barontus also eventually retired. Soon after joining the monastery, Barontus became deathly ill and seemed to have died, but in fact his soul was taken out of his body to be an object of dispute between demons and angels who engaged in an aerial battle with poor Barontus, the contested prey between them. After some time, St. Raphael appeared and it was agreed that the case should be adjudicated before St. Peter himself. On his way, Barontus was led through the four doors of heaven where he met deceased members of his own monastery and other categories of the saved, such as virgins. The demons held on to him throughout, so eventually Barontus, Raphael, and the demons came face to face with St. Peter. St. Peter claimed Barontus as his. Barontus had been tonsured and had entered the monastery, and furthermore he had given alms. And St. Peter, being well versed in scripture, pronounced that alms save the soul from death. On the basis of this unassailable proof of Barontus' salvation, the demons were routed. But not before St. Peter had used the keys of heaven to bonk one of these demons on the head. And I have a picture of that. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to... Um, uh, so, sorry, so this is what an ascetic was... This is what Barontus, well, to Paulina should have been looking like as a monk, right? With his uh, no clothes and, you know, very uh, living in... in poor circumstances. And that's Augustine of Hippo, just if you wanted to know what he looked like. Okay, so I, again, I apologize. The, the image, this image uh, is not available in the public sphere. And 
Um, it turns out that the only image I could find when Googling it was my book. So I'm sorry about this, but I wanted to show you just very quickly. Uh, this, this is from the Stowe Missile. Um, here is, um, uh, I guess, uh, St. Peter, I guess, uh, bonking. See, that's a key. And he's bonking the, 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 <laughs> the demon on the head, right? And this is Barontus in between the two of them. And notice that both the angel and the demon, they have books, right, in which they are contesting whether or not Barontus belongs to one or, or the other of them. But um, it's kind of a, a great uh, illustration there. Um, now that Barontus was safe in the company of St. Raphael and St. Peter, a second level of inquiry commenced. And it was at this point that Barontus was discovered to have committed a grave sin beyond having had three wives. He had held on to 12 gold coins um, when he had entered the monastery, contrary to the rule. Monastic rules of this era told prospective monks or nuns that they had to divest themselves of their goods lest they bring upon themselves the fate of An Ananias and Sapphira. This was a, fate, a sin worthy of damnation, as the story of the monk Just Justus in Pope Gregory's dialogues had made clear. Barontus was a greater sinner than he had first appeared, and St. Peter had pulled a fast one on the demons. Still, Barontus wasn't to get off scot-free. First, he had to agree to give up the 12 solidi. He had to give one solidus each month for 12 months to a priest who would certify that it had been done. Second, Barontus had to see hell before returning to his body so that he could see the kind of punishment he was missing. The vision concludes with Barontus' soul uh, returning to its body and with him waking up to the great jubilation of the monks. And this is just a picture of hell as it was uh, conceived in the early Middle Ages. This is the hell mouth. This is from the Winchester Psalter. It's a hell mouth and you can see all those souls uh, being crammed into the hell mouth. But most, Im Ooh, sorry. Um, but most importantly, notice that the angel here is locking the door. The whole point of that big key in the lock is to say, you will never get out. This is eternal. This is very important. This is an eternal hell. There's no way of getting out of here. Okay, I had an, just another image. Another, this one, I'm sorry, you can't see very well, but you can see people are chopping people's hands off and stuff. It gets really, really nasty. Okay. Um, so the core of Barontus' vision was told autobiographically. The sep there is a second author who introduced and concluded the work as a whole. And what's sort of interesting about uh, this work is that um, it, it places great weight on the value of giving up one's possessions at the point of joining the monastery. The core story is, you know, clearly intended to say you cannot, you have to give up all your possessions and then join the monastery and this is the, the right the correct life. The second author who wrote the introduction and the conclusion and clearly made some changes too, um, had the other message, you have to give alms, it's important to give alms. But of course if you had entered a monastery and given up all your possessions, you wouldn't have the possessions to give alms. So it's clear that this is a two, not only a two authored text, but that the authors had the different views, they were, they, the message that they were trying to make was a different message um, about, um, about how to handle uh, that money. Um, so the vision of Barontus then fossilizes a differential worth of two forms of Christian giving. But Barontus, as the protagonist, points at a third. Barontus wanted to have his cake and eat it too. He wanted to keep some of his money and yet enter the monastic community. Now this was probably not an uncommon desire among those who entered monasteries after a lifetime of wealth accumulation and who may have viewed the monastery as a pious retreat for the end of their lives. Evidently, Barontus had his own ideas about how to use his wealth as he prepared for death. And Barontus, like Paulinus, wanted the protection of the monastic garb without relinquishing all his possessions. Or, it's possible Barontus wanted to give away his wealth as alms um, if this was, you know, uh, um, if the idea here was the message is so strong to give up alms, to give alms saves you from death, that he might have thought, you know, I'm going to keep some back and do it this way. Maybe that's another option for me. 
Um, and, and ultimately, as, as a result of the vision, Barontes uh, gets to use his resources to secure his salvation in the way that he wanted to, by retaining some control and giving it out as arms over the course of the year. Like Paulinus, Barontes' fixation on his possessions, his intentional evasion of the rules that denied value to personal possessions, points to a point of friction that existed in the culture. Not everyone recognized the need to do exactly what the church leaders seemed to require. Was it an act of resistance against the rhetoric of renunciation that dominated the airwaves? Was there a hint of suspicion or, as I said, anti-clerical feeling in Barontes' desire to keep something for himself? It's not something we can be sure of. The difference between Paulina, Barontes and Paulinus, however, was that for Barontes in the 7th century, the rewards of renunciation were well worked out. His vision confirmed for him and in the eyes of his community that the loss of his possessions, however reluctant, was the price of entry into heaven. Paulinus in the 5th century was not so sure. Paulinus had been left to reconcile his experience of enormous loss with his faith in God. And as we have seen, this was not done without effort or without self-doubt. Okay. So I'm going to take a little detour into the afterlife here. Because besides visions, there were other sources on the afterlife and what it looked like and how one got there. Um, oh, I'm running a little out of time. Oh, okay. Maybe we won't, make, won't take that detour. <laughs> uh, maybe that's for the best. Um, I, the, the point I was going to make was that, um, that this, is, um, uh, the, this is a culture of uh, purgation and that um, many, of the, many works, but including uh, the liturgy of the time, specifically said that you had to be divested of your possessions, that you had to, that the soul could be encumbered by the things you owned and that it could drag you down and that at the last judgment there was going to be this fire, you go through it and those possessions and everything else that you were going to have were going to fall away away from you. And so, you, so the question is, uh, given that fact, um, you know, uh, what should your attitude to possessions um, actually be? Okay. Goodness, I really took more time than I thought. I apologize for that. Um, and then another section I will not talk about right now um, are the death scenes, because we actually can see um, a, sort of a, a, a difference in the death scenes of someone like Augustine at the beginning of the period and someone like Bede at the end. So Augustine, we're told about his death. What did he do? He shut himself up for 10 days before he died and, um, and basically didn't allow anybody near him. He read the scriptures and he just, he, it says he didn't make a will. He had no money. He made no will. He just completely tried to divest himself of any kind of uh, thing. By the time that Bede dies, we have a description of Bede's death. Bede had possessions. He's a monk in a monastery, and he has possessions. They're small things, pepper, handkerchiefs, books maybe, these, these small kinds of things. And he, was, he gives them to the, to the priests around him while he's dying so that they can say masses for him. So um, by the time we get to Bede, we have a different view of, you know, you actually possessions are something that you can use and negotiate with people who are still living to do something with, for you after death. Okay. Okay, so just a few concluding thoughts then. So, you know, given this, how do we view someone like Paulinus? So, um, obviously with the big picture, I hope to have shown that for Christians in this early period, possessions were linked not just to preparations for death, but also for their hopes of salvation. Um, and that uh, Christian authorities had emphasized that possessions could be both an obstacle and an opportunity in the quest of sal for salvation, but still there were some, like Paulinus and perhaps Barontus, whose relationship to their wealth was not fully accounted for in this messaging. Was it a form of resistance? Um, we, d we don't know, but th it's sort of suggestive. One challenge of dealing with the blare of religious messaging is to ask how far it, it has ex distorted our view of the practices of these Christians around death. To take an example, a fairly big example, wealthy Christians in this era sometimes chose to be buried with a multitude of possessions. How did these Christians reconcile this practice with the liturgy and the other religious cues that promoted purging oneself of one's uh, goods? But at the end of the day, the question that, um, that, that really um, 
press on me is how do we assess Paulinus and his poem? How seriously do we take him? Is he a representative of one branch of an elite confronting devastating loss in the fifth century? Or is he someone who used his life story to outdo the trope of other poems that also claimed their humility before God? And can we determine how his poem was received at the time? And just, you know, the, the poem's transmission um, is really serendipitous. Uh, you know, there's only two manuscripts survived the Middle Ages. One of them has since been lost. And so it's not like one of these works that gets um, copied and copied and copied, which sort of suggests that maybe the work doesn't appeal that much to uh, later monks. And, um, and, you know, there are no saints in it, no demons in it. So maybe it just didn't suit the fashion of the, of the later Middle Ages. But I do think that, that he presents a challenge for the historian. I think we have to confront the possibility that this poem was the product of a flawed man who was something of an oddity. Um, or maybe it's just the culture of the super rich, which may also just be odd too, right? Uh, Paulina shows no concern, for example, for the slaves and farmers whose lives may have been made worse by his abandonment of his estates. And just to give you an example, we know that for one major estate outside of Rome, when there, that, those, uh, uh, Melania and Pinianus gave that up, 8,000 slaves were, it, were manumitted and suddenly found themselves with no food and no home or anything. I mean, they, there's, there's incredible social upheaval behind these easy words, oh, then I decided to go to Marseille, right? Um, you know, um, so... I like uh, Brown's comment about uh, the wealth of villas. He says, these are people who wish to show that they were rich, that they intended to remain rich, and they greatly enjoyed it. And I think that you see that. Finally, I believe Paulinus's poem, for all his, its challenges, shows us that it was possible for a Christian to have a different view of possessions, death, and salvation from that advocated by the preponderance of church writings in this era. It shows us that possessions were about something more than wealth. Loss was about something more than poverty. They could be about salvation. And that, in the end, is a very medieval view. <laughs>